right, let's jump in. I want to tell you two, two stories of two individuals that happen side by side of men who, despite their disadvantages, despite their setbacks, they do not allow that to keep them back from missing out on the open door of Jesus. So I want you to turn with me into the book of Mark. That's where we're going to start. And we're going to talk about Bartimaeus, and then we're going to flip over and talk about Zacchaeus. Now, Bartimaeus was a blind man. Now, before I jump into his story, though, I want you to know where Jesus is, okay? Jesus is coming in and out of the, the city of Jericho in these stories, and then he's heading on the road to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which means he is headed to the triumphal entry. He's headed to the week of Calvary. It's just around the corner, so his, 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 his death and his resurrection are around the corner. So that's kind of where we're at. So it says this, Mark 10, 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart. Get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on his way. Scholars say in following him, that means he actually became a disciple of Jesus and began following him. He would have followed him into Jerusalem. Now if we read about Zacchaeus, uh, Zachari I'm sorry, Zacchaeus, the other Z-man, <laughs> We're going to read about him in Luke 19, picking it up in number one. It says, he entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran out ahead, climbed up on the sycamore tree to see him, and he was about to pass up that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down. I must come stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be in the guest of a man who was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Amen. There goes my rags, but that's okay. Okay, so before we dive into these two individual stories, I want to first draw some parallels for you, okay? Because both of these men, like I said, despite their disadvantages and setbacks, they got to access the open door of Jesus, and they both received transformed lives. Bartimaeus recovered his sight, became a disciple of Jesus, and then Zacchaeus, he first had a transformation of his heart, and as a result of that, if you took notice, he became extremely generous and a beautiful kingdom principle to the people around him. But the bigger parallel that we see between these two stories is that they both had to figure out how to get around the crowd to access their open door. So before I dive into this, I want to ask you, what is your crowd? Who is your crowd that you need to get around to access the open door that Jesus is bringing you? Is it your fear? Is it your anxiety? Is it the news and media, too many facts and opinions crowding you? What is the crowd that you need to get around? Because like I said, we're going to access the abundant life that Jesus has for us, the open doors, through our profession and through our posture, but we got to work out how to get those things around the crowd. So if we look at the profession of Bartimaeus, what he cried out, he said, son of David, have mercy on me. The first thing I want you to note about your profession is that it has to be a profession that is shaped by truth. When he inquired what all the commotion was about, because remember he was blind, he couldn't see what was happening, they said Jesus of Nazareth is about to pass by. But when he calls out to him, he says, Jesus, son of David. Now that's interesting because to say Jesus of Nazareth is a simple fact, 
right, that he is a teacher, a man of good morale. But when Bartimaeus cries out, Jesus, son of David, that is reflecting a deeper revelation of truth that he held, that he's not any ordinary teacher, that this is Jesus, a man with messianic character, a man who has the power and the authority to create miracles. And so I want you to take notice that Bartimaeus, he didn't just simply copy and paste what the crowd told him, but he stood on his conviction and his revelation of truth of who Jesus truly was. Who we profess Jesus to be in this hour will determine what we believe he can do for us in this hour. Is your confession harmonizing with the crowd or are you standing on the conviction of truth knowing that my God will create a way through the wilderness? Don't allow truth to be robbed from you because we're so focused on the facts of life right now. We need to stand firm on the truth of God and make sure our profession is being shaped by it. The next thing I need you to take note of your profession is that it needs to be persistent. See, when the crowd tried to rebuke him and silence him, Bartimaeus, it says, cried out to Jesus all the more. Listen to me. When, our, when we can profess our truth with persistence, we will build up a resilience against the distraction of the haters in our world, against the discouragement, against the persecution. Bartimaeus didn't turn to the crowd and start arguing back with them, and he didn't listen to them either. He got over the crowd. Some of us here today need to get over the crowd. We just need to get over the crowd. We've been wasting so much time and energy yelling back at the crowd when all we need to do is get over them and cry out to Jesus all the more. We're missing doors because we're busy allowing the crowd to shape, allow us to get weary. At the beginning of this quarantine time, I remembered, you know, we're all obsessed with the news, every new report coming out, and okay, confession, I am not a very empathetic wife, so whenever Jake is sick, I just don't carry the empathy. I've been known for throwing bananas at him when he had a stomach ache, okay? Confession. But he had had a few nights of just not being able to sleep out of fear of the virus, and finally one night, enough was enough, I had had it. I rolled over, huffing and puffing at him, frustrated. Okay, what are your symptoms again? Okay, so I do what every good wife does. I began to Google. And I remember that he had been taking a lot of vitamin C packets. You know those emergency packets are like 1,000 milligrams a packet? So I was like, okay, Google, overdose of vitamin C. Wouldn't you know, <laughs> the symptoms all lined up. I go, babe. How many of those emergency packets have you been taking? Keep in mind, we're six weeks into this. He goes, I don't know, like five or six a day. <laughs> I was like, my gosh, it is 3 a.m., go to sleep. You have taken too much vitamin C. The next day, he goes to urgent care just to be sure. And I go, okay, if you're going to go to a doctor, you have to confess how much you've been taking of vitamin C. And so he goes to the doctor, he tells him, the doctor prescribes him this anti-acid drink and says, stop reading the news and stop taking so much vitamin C. And there you have it, folks. But we cannot allow the crowd to form our decision making, right? Bartimaeus did not allow it to deter him from taking hold of the God agenda on his life. And you know what I love about this story is that Jesus, when he heard Bartimaeus, he looked to the people around him and said, call him. And it was the they, the crowd, probably his disciples too, that go to Bartimaeus and say, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So just for a moment, I wanna flip the tables on us. And let's take a temperature check, because we're so used to taking those. But let's take one on our hearts right now. Is what I'm professing, what I'm tweeting, what I'm Instagramming, is it rebuking and silencing the Bartimaeuses around me? Or am I being the ones who are saying, Take heart, get up, Jesus is calling you. I have a declaration for us, church, that we are not called to be the crowd blocking out the open door opportunities for the people around us, but we are called to be ambassadors, ministers of Christ that are helping them to get out of their pain, get out of their distress, and allow them to find Jesus in this moment. Oh, can I just encourage us that as we approach November 3rd, we cannot allow how we use our First Amendment right to cancel out our ability to hold firm to the Second Commandment. Let me say it this way. 
We cannot allow how we choose to invoke our right to speak to cancel out our ability to love thy neighbor. Don't be a crowd, be an ambassador of Christ. See, even Jesus, he was on the greatest cause, right? He was headed to Jerusalem, but he still allowed his journey to be interrupted for the mission, for the sake of reviving this one man's life. And we see that again in Zacchaeus, do we not? For your profession, is it shaped by truth? And is it persistent? Is it getting over the crowd? The posture of Zacchaeus, let's look at his story. We read about Zacchaeus. How did he position himself to take the open door? of Jesus, it says he ran ahead, he climbed up on a sycamore tree so that he could see him as he was passing by. So the first thing we need to know about our posture in this time is that we need to carry a posture of surrender. We need to carry a posture of humility because it'll allow us to remove every distraction, every crowd so that we can keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. For Zacchaeus to run ahead, pull up his little skirt and climb a tree like a little boy, well that would have been quite undignified. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Zacchaeus abandoned and surrendered his pride. He surrendered the fear of what people would think of him. He even surrendered the comfort of his money so that he could access the open door that Jesus was bringing him. How incredible is it? I find it interesting that when you read Zacchaeus' story, it comes shortly after the rich young ruler. And you remember the rich young ruler. He when he got invited to follow Jesus, it required him to sell what he had and give it to the poor. And it says he walked away from Jesus very sad. And Jesus says how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. But then we have Zacchaeus because he carried a posture of surrender. Oh, what did he get to do? He got to be a personification of showing what may seem impossible is possible with God, he got to inherit the kingdom of God. He got to just see, he didn't just see Jesus, but he met Jesus head on. And that's what happens when we carry a posture of humility, when we surrender those comforts, those things that we've yoked ourselves to in this season because it's just easy and it feels good and it doesn't challenge us. But when we actually submit those things under Jesus, we will run smack dab in front of him and he's gonna call you out by name and say, get down here, I must come and spend time with you. You always get more than you expect when you purge the distractions and you stay focused on Jesus through your posture of surrender. The next thing I want you to know about your posture, and I'm gonna get ready to close here, is that you need to carry a posture of joyful expectation. Joyful expectation. Now I know that might be like, I don't have a whole lot to be joyful about right now, but let's read on how Zacchaeus did it. When Jesus called him out by name, it says he hurried down and received him joyfully. But when they, being the crowd, when they saw it, they grumbled, he has gone to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. And I love that that didn't deter Zacchaeus' moment with Jesus. He didn't let it take away or rob him of his joy in that moment. But instead he received him with joyful expectation. If you wanna seize the, and step into the doors of opportunity that Jesus is bringing you, we gotta shut out the grumblers that were just persecuting him, calling him a sinner. And we have to all the more receive Jesus with the joy that is made available to us. Can I tell you that this season is not just meant to be endured, but it's meant to be enjoyed. You can enjoy this time and it can happen if you allow the fruit of the Holy Spirit to flow in you and flow out of you. Because when we receive Jesus with joy and the fruit of the Spirit grows in us, it will become a blessing to the people around us, which is exactly what we see in Zacchaeus' story. It says in Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So I wanna ask you, are you being good medicine to the people around you? Or are you being a source of the heat, a source of the, the drought? See Zacchaeus, he receives a transformed heart. And out of that, he has this revelation like, Jesus, I'm gonna give half of what I have to the poor. And then anyone that I've defrauded, I'm gonna pay it back fourfold. That's way above and beyond the standard that would have been required by him. 
And what I love is that the people in the crowd that were just grumbling, I guarantee you they were grumbling because he had ripped them off at some point. But now here he is blessing them. Think about this. He's blessing the people who were just grumbling against him. When you carry a posture of joyful expectation, it's going to allow people to be inclined towards you and you to be inclined towards others because that is the Father's heart. I, I, I fear that in all this quarantine and all the masking and the gloving up and the six foot distancing, we've become a little lumpy, a little frumpy and a little dull. And it's not because of the quarantine 15. It's because there's been a lack of iron sharpening iron moments in our life. Oh man, it's been a lack of ironing, sharpening iron times. And so that's led to us developing poor postures or we get bent out of shape easily by what we see or read or what someone says or, you know. Oh, we need to figure out how to start sharpening ourselves. We need to get in a group. We need to get to she night. We need to find ourselves amongst the community so that they can call those behaviors out in us and that we can be sharp, so we can be good medicine, not drying up the bones. I am sick and tired of every time I read the news and media, it's drying out the bones of this city. But let me tell you, we are called to be Ezekiel's of 2020, to be prophesying to the dry bones so that they can receive the breath of heaven so they can rise up and know that this too will pass, that there are open doors for them to access. So just in this time, I want to ask you, what has your profession been? What has it looked like? Has it been mimicking what the crowd around you is saying? Maybe you need to have a confessing moment with Jesus right now so that you can shift and begin to profess and believe for the truth that God wants to bless you abundantly. Listen to me, there are just as many opportunities right now in your life than there were January 1st of this year, okay? The government doesn't determine the opportunities that God wants to present to you. It will be determined by you getting up and igniting yourself with some faith and believing that the best is still ahead. Can you say it? But you say, Nicole, Nicole, I'm just a realistic person. That would be disingenuous. No, my friends, I have fallen for that trap so many times. Can I tell you, allow the voice of faith to rise up in you. Allow it to be stirred up. Start reading the scripture. God is making a way through the wilderness of this pandemic, but we have to posture ourselves in order to see it. Are you carrying a posture of surrender? Are you carrying a posture of joy so that you may receive it? I just wanna remind you that maybe the open door Maybe it seems like a small thing. At the beginning of this year, I remember noticing that Winston just wasn't accepting my affirmation as much as I had hoped anymore. And so I did the annoying mom thing. Buddy, I said, I love you, say it back to me. And then as the pandemic hit and all of a sudden I'm now pivot, full-time mom, full-time teacher with him, I was carrying all these things trying to spin all the plates. And I just remember God speaking to me, grabbing my attention, saying, Nicole, ministry right now is gonna be motherhood for you. And so I had to surrender. I had to take a posture of surrender, surrendering certain things to God. And the Holy Spirit began to show me open doors of opportunities with my son. Maybe it was sitting on the couch instead of busying myself in the kitchen. Maybe it was sitting on his bed and just letting him talk at night then jumping on you know, a call or a meeting. And the other day I was walking out of his bedroom and before I had a chance to say it, Mom, I love you. And it just hit me so hard. And I fell to my knees and I said, thank you, Jesus, for this open door of opportunity. Thank you. What well, might seem like a small tweak, a small thing. Can I tell you, it will lead you onto a trajectory of the greatest outcome of your life. Oh, I am believing that there are open doors that God is wanting to show you. If you just give him the space, posture yourself to see it. Thank you, Jesus. God didn't declare that young men would see visions and old men would dream dreams for it all to just perish now. He is invested. That's right. 
I feel this is a prophetic moment for our church that what has been deemed impossible is possible and we have the supernatural, we have the Holy Spirit in us to help stir up the faith again, to believe again that what might seem lost is not lost on Jesus. Maybe what looks like a closed door for you right now is pointing you to an open door of faith. I am believing that Jesus is gonna show you that way. So I just wanna take a moment and I wanna pray for you. Wherever you are, just take a posture of surrender. It's just this, lifting your hands. You might feel silly sitting on your couch doing it. Maybe you stand up and do it. But I believe God wants to just speak to you in this time and he's gonna give you a picture or a word. He's gonna stir something inside of you. Maybe if you want to, you really want prayer in this moment, you can put your name in the chat, request prayer, a team member's gonna pray with you. But right now, I just wanna take this moment to say, Heavenly Father, I surrender the voice of the crowd. I surrender right now my posture of pride. I surrender the control. I give those things to you. And I profess, Jesus, that you are still Lord, that you are on the throne, that you are making a way through the wilderness, that the window of heaven has not been shut to me. Oh no, that there are still great days ahead for you. Holy Spirit, I thank you right now that you are beginning to intercede, that you are showing every heart and mind an opportunity for them to seize in the name of Jesus. 